Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia. Welcome back to the episode of our Art of War guide series regarding everything battle related for Total War Three Kingdoms. And today we're taking some advice from one of the subscriber who commented on our last video about the champion vanguard and strategist setup and doing something called the recruitment priority list. And this is really about where you should spend your money on in the early game for your very first or maybe your second army because the subscriber made a good point saying that the army stack that I was featuring was a doom stack. In my opinion though, I didn't think it was a doom stack because all the unit used were pretty much the cheapest options available. They were either militia units or they were just the first upgrade in terms of archers. And the army wasn't as pricey, at least in my opinion, because that's usually the first army that I go for in any campaign with only minor exceptions where I might cheap out on a few of the shock cavalry. I might not go six shock cavalry because they are quite expensive in the early game. And they made a fair point that this full stack is something that you should be aiming for. Well, that's true. And we're gonna make some adjustment to that today. But before we jump into what I'm gonna do, I do have to make one point. In the early game, you often will have a story mission a tutorial mission of sorts that will give you discounts to recruitment. That's a golden opportunity to get your army ready, especially your first army. Before that point, if you could disband everyone to save money, that's the best option. That way you have a nice lump sum of cash that you can use to recruit your first full army because not only do you have to afford upkeep after you recruit them, you have to afford to recruit them in the first place. And recruiting them is the easiest place to save a lot of your hard earned cash in the early game because you can get about 10% from that mission and you could likely get 5% through the title system. So you can have a pretty decent discount to your first recruitment and that's why I like to build out a first full army as early as possible, take advantage of that short time frame when you have the discount. But let's assume you already have that first army, the missions are done, and you're trying to afford a second army. Well, this is where this priority list would come in. I listed one general of each class on the left, starting with a strategist because he is the most vital piece. They are ranked by importance to an army. If you have to spend money on a unit 4 general, the strategist is where you would start. And then after that is a champion, because once you have your range component, you need the front line to protect your range, or else if the enemy can just walk their cavalry up to your range, all those money spent on those trebuchets are going to be wasted. So the front line is the second most important piece. Now the third piece here is interesting. We did feature Vanguard last time as a very strong third general for our army, but here we put the commander. And the reason is very simple. In the early game, sometimes your strongest general is your faction leader. And a large majority of the faction leaders in the game are commander class. So often you're stuck with a commander that you have to incorporate into an army. So in those cases, you need to make do with what you have. And the commander is gonna be featured third here, followed by the vanguard, and lastly by the sentinel. Now the sentinel class is not bad. They can make for really good front lines after you pick up enough skills on your sentinel. So they need to level up because oftentimes you need multiple skills on the sentinel skill tree to make the units efficient because you need to give them charge negate because they don't come with charge reflect like the polearm units. So in that sense, oftentimes you're going to be using your sentinels as assignment characters or as administrator characters early on for the cost saving. And once they finish building up those commanderies, perhaps it's time for them to come out to the field once they have the necessary skills and they can be awesome frontline units. But in the early game, they're not as good. So they're going to be sitting on the back here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be telling you guys which units to recruit first. So the first unit you need to recruit if you are thinking about recruiting an army is one trebuchet. That's the bare minimum. If you don't have a siege weapon, your battle is going to be very different. When you're on offense, you have to march your troops up. It takes fatigue to travel the distance and you have to go through the enemy range fire. If you have a siege weapon, even just one, the enemy will march towards you. And you can use this to impact at least 200 casualties on the enemy per battle, assuming full-size armies on large unit size. 
and they can also be used for flaming shots to burn down enemy watchtowers. But one is enough. If you have the money and you want to play for a late game setup because you want to rank these up for your late game, then you will go for two. But let's assume money's tight. So the first place to spend money is one trebuchet. Then after that, the second place to spend your money is one spear guard. This will require you to have a champion for this, and that's why champions are important. Spear guards are vital to any army because of the formations they have. They're one of the only early game units with access to the turtle formation, which we see here. It gives you additional 100 points of range block chance, putting him at 155. More importantly, the shield in the turtle formation faces all directions, 360 degrees of protection, because range block chance only blocks non-artillery projectiles from the front, wherever the shield is facing. So if you see a group of spear guards, not any formations walking away from you with the back exposed, just shoot them. It does the same damage as you would shooting a militia unit, because if you look at it, 20% armor, 20% armor. The shield armor does not apply unless it's front facing, and the range block chance does not apply unless it's front facing. So in a sense, you need to have 360 degree protection if you're hoping to use turtle to march up to enemy sieges, because those towers are going to be hitting you from different angles, the enemy archers from inside will be hitting you from different angles. So you need at least one, because once you have one, you can use it to march up to take towers. That's what's most important for these units. Or you can march this unit up to tank towers while your other units can flush out key targets. And speaking of the other units that will flush out key targets, we're going to go back to the strategist for where we're going to continue spending our money. If it's super early on, you don't have the reform for things, you want to go for Archer Militias. They are very, very cheap. And you want to spam this unit if you can't afford anything else. Because pound for pound, Archer Militias will deal the most casualty count for your army early on. If you go for melee units, as in that's where you spend your money, what will happen is that they can't outperform, as in if you're fighting a Z Militia that you control, versus a Z militia that the AI control, the enemy AI controlled Z militia will beat your unit every single time. Because on difficulty levels above normal, the AI units get hidden stat boost on their units that you will not see on the unit card. So 1v1, your unit, same exact bonuses versus their units with hidden bonuses, uh, in addition to any bonuses their general might provide it, their unit's always gonna win. So you can't beat them with the same number of units. If you try to overwhelm them with more than their number, then what happens is that you take massive casualty because melee fights encourage a lot of casualty. That slows your campaign down. You have to waste time replenishing. If you have range units, the part of you doing damage is your arrows. Your unit themselves will not get touched. Therefore, they're very efficient early on and very useful for any army. It's essentially bringing a gun to a knife fight because the knife will never get close to you, assuming you have proper protection. So if you are cheap, that's where you're going to go for with things. And in addition to this, if you can get the composure skill on the strategist, you get fire arrows. Fire arrows are good for a couple things. They are good for dealing less damage, but dealing about four points of additional morale damage on the enemy and that could sometimes help you route an enemy unit, so that's useful. You can also have these units shoot the fire arrows at the enemy towers and fort towers to take them out by burning them. This is probably easier than having your trebuchet do it, especially early level trebuchets with poor accuracy, so that way you can save your trebuchet shot for densely packed enemy units inside of a siege. Archer Militia's fire arrow can also be used to burn down a town because if you can cause settlement damage, you can get up to about 20 points of morale damage on enemies, and that make many of the siege fights in the early game quite easy when the enemy only have low morale militia units. Because look at this unit ourselves. The base morale here is 19. Assume the AI have some boost on it. We can get 15 points morale off by doing a night battle, because you have composure, you have night battle. 
and then you burn the town for 20 more points. That's minus 35 points, the units ready routing. And if you can put them under fire, that's another four points. Put them under fire arrow, that's another four points. So you can get about 43 points of morale damage on the enemy just by burning down the town with the fire arrows. So it's very efficient. You don't always have to go after the enemy health. You can go after their morale as well. So archer militias are great for that. If you can get the reform, the one that requires the school building, private tutor, to unlock the archer, then you most definitely want to switch your archer militias with archers as soon as possible. Even if you already spent the money on recruiting archers, militias, you want to swap over to archers as fast as you can. They're not much more expensive than archer militias, only a hundred difference in cost of recruiting, way cheaper than any sort of melee militia units, and they're much better. So if we look at the stat difference here, the key one that's going to matter is damage. 31, 15, 28, 12. Fire rate also goes up from 10 to 12, and range goes up from 180 to 200, which is a key factor. Because 180 only makes you outrange melee units. Every single early game range units, that's the archer and the crossbowman, will outrange you by a bunch. And that way you have to take extra casualty just to reach the enemy. Now of course if you're talking about repeating crossbowmen, they're a different breed. They're only used for suppression and to wipe out enemy cavalry charges. We'll talk about them in a future episode. They're not as bad as they seem. Um, but if you can upgrade to archers, do it as soon as possible. And even if you have archer militias ready, just upgrade. It's worth your time. And these units will gain those ranks that you need for them to become powerful late game units. So after you have your range units done, so that's gonna be your priority number three, you're gonna go back and flush out your melee line. And here, if you can't afford spear guards because they are quite pricey, get one and then just opt for Z militias everywhere else because the point of these unit is to protect you from cavalry and shield away your range line. So what you want to do with this setup is just put him at the foremost point of your formation. Instead of doing a line, do a line with a bump in the middle and have the spear guard be the bump and that way the enemy range units will shoot at him before they fire at your militia units and they will stay shooting at him uh, to have him absorb all the enemy range damage and your spear units at that point can just protect your flanks your backs your other parts of your front from any cavalry charges they're not good units they will route this is mainly a cost saving maneuver if you have to if you can afford things obviously more spear guards the better and you don't need um, six spear guards in my opinion four is decent enough just to protect the front because that's where you have the melee line clash the flank is always against enemy uh, cavalry therefore having z militias is good enough and that's the setup for where you need to spend your money there are no cavalry units so far and that's okay because your three generals are automatically very powerful cavalry units and you can use them as emergency cavalry in the early game if you have the money to spare, and we're assuming we're talking about a leader who is a commander, then what you want to do is recruit one, just one, mounted saber militia. And this unit's good enough for 85% range block chance because your leader will most likely be able to pick up the dignity skill for 20% extra. And their job is going to be to absorb the enemy arrow damage because they can tank up a lot of arrows if you have them faced correctly to the front. 85% range block chance, and then 50% missile resistance. So you take very little damage, about 7% of the total damage output of the entire archer unit. That's the only amount that would hit you. And you have very tanky health per cavalry, because you have 30 cavalry units for about 50k health. If you look at an infantry, 72k for 120 units, just do the division and you know how much health is per unit. About 600 here, and for here, it's like over a thousand. Therefore, you can take so much more damage before you lose an actual unit. So it doesn't hurt your replenishment as much, and it doesn't hurt your combat capability as much. You don't need to spam these. They are not very good at charging things. Your leaders will do better. 
having one or two is good enough to just take away the ammo of your opponent. That's kind of their main job. And if you have a commander, what you could also do is have them recruit、uh, spear guards. They can after they reach rank three, I believe. And there can be an extra unit for your front line because very sturdy, very powerful unit. Or you can go for some mounted lancer militia if you want to maneuver more of a hammer envoy style. It's probably more efficient because you end up taking less casualties than having a more you know sturdier front line. Because in my opinion, if you have a sturdy front line, you're encouraging the enemy to fight you melee versus melee, and that actually will just cause you to have more casualties and you will slow down your early game campaign. So I'm in favor of you know more cavalry if possible, but. Spear guards on a commander is always option, especially for factions who do not have a champion.、Um, get a champion though; they're really good early game. They do fall off, but if you don't and you have a good commander, that's definitely an option too to have them field. Let's say you know you can do three units of spear guard for front line, two Z militias for the flank, and then one、uh, mounted saber militias for cavalry and for arrow absorption. And that's an alternative if you don't have a commander at all. And then at this point, once you have your front line settled, you have some sort of anti-range, whether it's spear guard, whether it's mounted saber militia, you have all your range damage component of your army composition. And let's say we picked one of these, you can start recruiting cavalrys. And at this point, is as many as you can afford. One is great, two is good, gets better and better and better and better. And when you use them. You want to micro them almost individually. What I mean by that is, you want to select one unit, have them charge into one unit. Don't select all six and have them charge into one unit. That's very inefficient. Units will crowd themselves. They will spread over a long distance. So let's say the first unit, 30 cavalry, they're not going to be tightly packed. When you have all six selected, they're going to be dragged out. And what happens when that hap when, when that divide happens is that they can't target the unit efficiently. So you have like one or two cavalry jump into the pile, and it kind of blocks the other units, and you just don't get an efficient knockback. So instead of having a clumped, you know, arrowhead thrusting into the enemy formation, you have six long trickles of units because you selected all six together, and then they're just trickling into the enemy formation. A lot less damage. So you definitely want to micro these. You know, as individually as you can, and pick how many you want to afford. And you don't have to upgrade these units. The beauty of the mounted lancer militia is there's not really a great upgrade for these until you get to super late game cavalry that requires deeper reforms. So, for example,、um, the direct upgrade is the lance cavalry, and the upgrade itself. If you look at the speed boost, you lose so much speed on these units once you upgrade to the slightly Upgraded armor version goes from 20% to 32%. It's not a big deal, and it slows you down by a bunch, which is a big deal. Damage takes a small jump, which does not matter much for cavalry because you're not using them for sustained fights. Unless you're countercharging enemy cavalry, then the spear units will be a pretty good counter to something like a mounted saber militia the enemy will throw at you. But even at that point, mounted lancer militia versus some Um, you know, melee cavalry, even though the upgraded Zen Sword Guard variant will win, and you can always win with sheer numbers.、Um, I just don't think Lance Cavalry is a great upgrade.、An、upgrade that I will consider in the mid game is if you have Cataphracts. So Cataphracts are super slow, but you are jumping multiple tiers of armor. You're going to 53%. You're getting the mass to compensate for the loss of speed. So that your unit can actually still deal more, in,、um, you know, impact damage on the knockback. The damage is heavily skewed towards armor piercing at this point on this unit, and it's just a much better unit overall. So that's the upgrade that I would kind of consider. I wouldn't really consider any intermediate ones. You're trying to stack up as much experience as you can on these units, and they serve you decently well for majority of the game. You can even run this in the late game. It doesn't make too much of a difference because you're mainly using them for flank charges where the enemy is exposed. And if you have, you know, go all the way to get, you know, heavy cataphract, which is a decent upgrade. It's one of the few heavy units that's a decent upgrade because you lose no speed, you gain even more armor, and some range block chance as well. Pretty great units. Way more charge bonus, so that's something you can consider too.、Um, if you can get J Dragons, 
get rich dragons they have the shield they're very interesting hybrid between like a melee cav and a shot cav um, so these are all options in the late game but for the most of the game this is good enough and lastly if you're stuck with a sentinel what should you do with them well it depends on what your third general is and i mean you always have strategists and you're stuck with a sentinel if your third general is cavalry right if you're building your third general as cavalry then the sentinel job is frontline and if your sentinel job is frontline then you kind of have to go with um, something like a Zen sword guard to use in a formation in the same role as you would use a spear guard and then the rest of the units you actually want to go with z militias because you can actually give them charge negate on top of their inherent charge reflect and that can be as efficient as what we showed earlier with one spear guard with all z militias that's one option you can go if you have a front line already and you have a range component and no cavalry then what you want to do with your sentinel is actually go range and that actually magnify your range damage and just rely on your front line to protect you from enemy cavalry or use your generals to fight off the enemy cavalry you know three generals bundled together with skills can crush cavalry really really easily and what you want to go at this point is you want to go with you know archer militia is the only thing you can recruit but early game like i said they're the cheapest and probably the most efficient damage unit doesn't waste any replenishment if you are rushing for onyx dragons that's where you would put them as well uh, that would be a great unit to place on your sentinel you don't see it here because uh, the custom battles don't allow you to use dragon units on the wrong unit type but that is where you would want to go and the reason why you can do this with your sentinels is because sentinels have skills that boost a lot of range they have access to fire arrows they have access to zeal which gives you that 10 percent armor piercing range damage which can be boosted um, on all your range units in the whole army including your other range components so you can have a very heavy range component army if you have the right skills which is why we mentioned sentinels needs a lot of skills to shine so they need levels and early game they're probably best sitting in your court doing assignments doing administrative duties so they can gain those levels easily and once they have those skills put them out on the field and they can be quite powerful for you so i hope this priority list will help you guys understand what type of units you're looking for in the early game and the order of things because you always want to start with a trebuchet you always want to try to get yourself something anti-range whether that's a spear guard which is most optimum or a mounted saber militia which is you know after that mobile sponge that can tank up the most damage and if you can't get those as you can't get those two classes somehow and you have a sentinel then something like a Zen sword guard something with the formation of shield wall that way you can get your range block chance up to 90 percent and that's effic efficiently you know effectively um, pretty much what you get out of the mounted saber militia although you are not as mobile uh, it's not the same as turtle even if you get the um, let's say you can get like uh armor bonus a set bonus that gives you that 10 percent extra range block chance and you boost this to 100 right you're a 90 right now with the formation and then your general has that um, I think it's a purple set with the Sovereign of the Blade. I, I kind of forgot the item set bonus, but it does give you 10 additional range block chance, and that push you to 100%. You will still get killed by some arrow towers because your shield wall is only front facing. So if they get the arrow, you know, at a certain degree, like a little angle on you, they will still kill your units. Not the same as the turtle. So turtle is still extremely valuable, and that's kind of the order where you should do things. Hopefully, this quick guide is a helpful one for you and we'll see you guys next week. Bye!